long day and you'd all like to go off to dinner. But this is going to be a really interesting panel. And there are only three of us. So the the, my two panelists that I'm going to introduce in a minute are going to have plenty of opportunity to talk to you in depth about our topic, which is women in technology. Uh, my name is Dr. Arlene Diamond. I have a consulting firm, and I do leadership, professional development, and management consulting. And I do a lot of consulting into the high-tech industry and a lot of work uh, with women. But I am probably the lowest tech person in the room. So notice, everybody else was using their cell phones. You may not remember what these things are, but they're called paper. And I'm going to introduce the panelists reading from paper. So sitting beside me is Dr. Bell Why? Why is that? Way, sorry. Uh, she's a former dean of engineering at San Jose State U. She's considered one of the top women leaders in the field of technology. She served as provost and vice president for academic affairs at Chico. Uh, and as the Charles W. Davidson College of Engineering, Don Bell, dean of engineering, at San Jose State for 10 years. She's currently San Jose State University's Carolyn Gaudry Chair in Engineering Education and Innovative Learning. She's the founder and president of the Center for Advancing Women in Technology that creates the Technical Pathways Initiative. Beside her is Dr. Ekta Dang. Hey, we're all doctors up here. Uh, Dr. Dang has been a successful corporate executive, speaker, and writer in Silicon Valley for almost two decades. She's currently the co-founder and CEO of You First Capital, which provides venture capital as a service to mid-sized and large corporations. She has solid experience in both venture capital and on operating side when she was at Intel. She's driven investment deals in several areas, which include e-commerce, security, um, what's IoT? I don't know what IoT is. Okay. Uh, she's a seasoned industry executive with over 15 years of experience in product, business development, and venture capital. She brings a stellar network from the venture capital and corporate world to the startups. She's a startup enthusiast and is a mentor at, at Alchemist Accelerator, Stanford, UC Berkeley, Google Launchpad, and others. She's been a member of Hillary Clinton's Technology Policy Advisory Committee and is an invited speaker at several top venture capital startup uh, conferences like TyCon, Silicon Valley Open Doors, and others. She has a PhD in physics and is a graduate of UC Berkeley Haas School Venture Capital Program. Uh, she's published several research papers in IEEE and other reputed uh, international journals. So this is a very impressive panel that we have. So the first question that I want to ask you is about your, your path. How did, you, how did you get where you wanted to go? Start from the beginning. What made you get into technology? Thank you, Arlene, first of all. I uh, really appreciate and uh, re really appreciate the introduction and honored to be here. Um, the path, um, well, it's been a long, uh, arduous path for sure, but a very interesting one. And uh, when I look back, um, there are moments that have really helped me grow to where uh, I think I've been able to um, open myself to grow more. So um, in terms of uh, the career path, I did my master's in physics and then uh, my PhD in um, physics as well with a focus around semiconductors. And that led me to start my corporate career in the semiconductor world at but Intel. Let, let, let me interrupt you. Why did you choose physics? It's, I mean, it's a very unusual career even today for women to choose. You chose it some years ago. Very good question, actually. Back then, um, uh, there was uh, very little mention or very few disciplines uh, around computer science. And uh, physics was the, was the most attractive thing in terms of uh, people who are seeking a, you know, a, a career uh, in, in, in sciences across different fields. And um, you know, that decision has to come actually in India where I did my schooling from at 10th grade or junior year. 
and um, I was I was really intrigued by uh, you know by the science itself, and was really greatly influenced by my dad, who would say, "If math is the mother of all sciences, physics is the dad of all sciences." So that, <laughs> I, I naturally got inclined towards studying physics. But what's not mentioned here, and um, I'm so honored to be sitting next to Dr. Wei here, is that my first ever job, albeit for a very small period of three to four months in the United States of America was at the San Jose State University. Ah. <laughs> so <laughs> I did teach uh, master's double uh, E students at San Jose State I taught psychology. Does that count? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> So, uh, Bell, tell us about, you, you know, why did you select? Yeah. Yes. Um, I, um, my family immigrated from Taiwan to the United States in 1973, so right after my high school. So I uh, studied biophysics as an undergrad at uh, UC Berkeley, and the reason is when I was in Taiwan, I was in the medical school track, and actually I was admitted to, into Taiwan University. Um, um, medical school. The whole point is not so much what I'm interested in this and that because is you know coming from the community. Okay, Taiwan is if you are the best student, you want to get into the most competitive major to show that the world that you are the best student. Okay, but when I came to United States, I can I can choose my path. That actually poses challenge. Uh, to myself, because now I say, what? Okay, exactly what would interest me. And in the end, I chose engineering because I, I'm kind of thinking about this immigrant background. So you always want to gain that financial independence, the survival. So engineering is more practical than science, you know, is, you know, pragmatic. Actually, what I chose at the beginning is more environmental engineering. This is mid 70s because you know the environment pollution is a big thing. So as a young person, I said well, I really want to be part of a solution. But later, when I took courses in environmental engineering, and I realized it's not so much how good you are in terms of your technical skills; it's more of policy, the politics. Okay, that dominate everything. That as a young person, I say I didn't want to go into that field because I don't have that sense of agency, what I can do about it. So that kind of, I shift towards electrical engineering. And so I work as um, an aerospace company for two years, it's for aerospace. Right now it's a Jewish community center. Okay, so then I realized I want to learn more. So that's why I returned to Berkeley and um, study electrical engineering and computer science. So when I returned to Berkeley, I said, okay, the communication satellite is so interesting. I like to do that. But my classmates say, you must be kidding. Because then you, semiconductor is the future. It's right, there is so much excitement. So I end up specialized more semiconductor circuits. And so that's, that's my academic path. So I'm really sympathetic. Uh, when young people come to me because I'm in education to say, I really don't know I'm, what I'm interested in, what I should do, I, I, my, I share the experience with them, or also my own self-discovery and why you know, I chose what I, you know, I chose. Um, along the way, if we talk about you know, beyond that in terms of career trajectory, is when I was about to graduate with a PhD in electrical engineering, I already have classmates, okay, started their own companies. So this is, there is a gold rush. This is mid 80s. And so, you know, so that's why I'm thinking, I'm going to join company, corporate world. And I did an interview with the companies. But then I thought about more. I say, no, you know, there are so many people starting their companies. Probably nobody will miss me as an entrepreneur. But if I go to education, because I love people, I love learning, so education does give me that kind of platform uh, and environment. So that's why I chose uh, San Jose State to go to academia right after my uh, 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 PhD. So yeah, that's the, the academic that's pathway. Right. We can talk about career. Yeah. 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 Do, you want to add anything in terms, do you want to add anything in terms of your path? 
Absolutely. So yeah, so did my PhD, as I mentioned, and joined the corporate world um, as a young engineer, um, and more so an engineer of a woman of color in the engineering world, in the big corporate world, small fish in the big world, and then um, maneuvered my path through deep technical roles early on because I had this um, uh, urge and thirst to get uh, as much uh, inf you know, knowledge and experience as I, I, as I could in deep technical roles, and then eventually gravitated over to more business development as well as venture investing roles across uh, a variety of technologies, uh, but largely uh, Internet of Things, uh, cybersecurity, um, and uh, somewhat into the e-commerce space as well. Uh, I'm actually the CEO of an innovation hub now called You First Capital, which is bringing together universities, startups, and corporations together. Uh, we are setting up dedicated venture funds for corporations to invest in their sectors of interest, which is, um, which is being well received by the corporate world because they were looking for an opportunity where they can get access to external innovation uh, while getting the deep technical expertise to scout that innovation in a way that is of strategic in importance to their businesses. So the question I want, I'm going to ask you two questions at once because they, they, they tie in. Um, what were some of the challenges that you faced in the beginning when you were starting your, your careers in this male-dominated world? And then once you became in leadership roles, as, again, as women, what were the challenges that you faced there? And, I, and I'm going to assume that there was differences. Um. So I think at the beginning when you start off as young, so just give you a um, background that I joined uh, electrical engineering department. So 24 professors. So I was the first woman professor, you know, in their 40 year history. The electrical engineering department was created right after World War II. The second one did not show up till I became the electrical engineering chair. So I'm thinking about you. Probably, yeah. <laughs> you taught when I was there. Uh, so, so the point is, in that kind of environment, is you know, and also I'm I'm thinking about whether it's my gender or it's my cultural background. Is when you see men, they are very you know. Now I know it's right. They talk that some people talk their game very well, very articulate. So you get a really intimidated big time because you know you really don't know if because he's so capable, can do so much. I just share ex examples, right? So it's, you know, there is a, a, a position, a chair position. And so I told the dean that time, I say, you know, I see so many challenges with that situation and we need to address, uh, address those issues. But my male counterpart would go to the dean to say, I can do X, Y, Z, no problems. And he lasts only one year, okay? So, but, so this is like, you know, I gain more insight later on, but when you start off, you really, you know, feel like, I think it's kind of challenges, or people treat you differently, but good thing about me is because I kind of get used to it, because in the double E department, Berkeley, you know, you know, in one class, 35 students, I was the only woman. So it's just like, I, I treat my, male classmates, you know, just like, okay, I'm one of them, is right. Just, just not so very cognizant of that, but sometimes that, that's a situation. Later on, when I became leader, I think it's two sides. One is obviously have a different approach because once again, this is um, educational environment, engineering, quite often the, the, the language people use is right. The professor will say, Students, whatever, it's right. And if you flunk something, you're no good. You know, I say we can say students that they cannot be good engineers, but we should not decimate them as individuals. It's right. So just have a different approach. And also, when I inter, because in Silicon Valley in San Jose State, so when I interact with industry people, the first thing is they think, oh, okay, your engineering dean must be a, a white male. So I'm so different. So I, they remember me. Okay, when I contact them, I say, oh, I remember you because I'm so different. So I think I, 
I actually, that's my advantage. That's it, really, you just made two really interesting points and, and I wanna kinda underscore them. One is, and I do a lot of, of coaching for women, right? Is we as women tend, and I'm only making a generalization, I have to quickly say that, right? We as women tend to be the good girls and, and then hope will get rewarded. Whereas your male counterpoint who basically knew he'd figure out later how to work it out. He just walks in and says, I want the job, basically. And, and that's, a, that's a kind of significant difference. But the other point that I, I almost started laughing is chuckling, is there is an enormous advantage to being the different one, as well as some enormous disadvantages. So it's, it's really nice to hear that you took advantage of the advantages. <laughs> so. Um, in terms of uh, challenges, uh, particularly early on in my career, since I was, um, you know, an engineer, and um, very often the only female in the room, in many rooms yeah. actually, and that initially I thought it's the start of my career. I'm a young engineer, so it's 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 expected to be that way. But as I grew up the career ladder into a, a variety of roles, both vertically as well as horizontally, I feel that the rooms still look very similar. So, um, you know, the challenges I had early on, some of them were actually related to me and how I grew up. And I think they were very, um, there were some, there were, there were great learnings in those challenges. Uh, you know, initially I would go and sit in my den and I would uh, tell myself if I'm the best engineer, then I've nailed it. And uh, lo and behold, the world was not that. <laughs> it was not about one. getting the best technical expertise under your belt, but to be able to go in a meeting room, communicate the bad news to a bunch of senior people, um, based on the data that I've been able to, <laughs> able to analyze and do it in a way that I don't come out being disliked you know, in the room and, and regarded and appreciated. And there, are, there is a whole slew of skill sets that have to go to be able to do that in a room and come out that way. And uh, one of them is being obviously not to take anything personally, uh, but the most important, I think, is to be able to understand that it, while it's good to grow in your own space, it is very important to grow in terms of understanding who is around you. And to be able to get that emotional intelligence and not just build contacts, but build relationships with those who you have to communicate the bad news to. And this really <laughs> is not taught in engineering schools. It is not taught anywhere unless you enter a workforce and, and, and fail a couple of times uh, and really feel bad about it and then try to, you know, uh, try to introspect and understand how we can do things differently. Uh, so our, coming out of those engineering um, discussion rooms into more business development and venture capital, and it's not a, it's a public secret <laughs> it's that um, venture capital is very male dominated, and uh, the entrepreneurial community, you know, still has there, uh, there there still exists some unconscious or conscious biases, um, both in terms of how the venture community looks at women entrepreneurs, but also how um, uh, the women entrepreneurs are, you know, the, the venture capitalists are looked at through, or through the window of the male entrepreneurs. So biases exist both ways, and I think it is being able to uh, achieve what you want to achieve out of that short conversation or this time span you have to be able to achieve and get the best out of it. So uh, you just again said something critically, critically important. The importance of being social, the importance of emotional intelligence, the importance of being able to deal with people, not just okay. with things. And you know, I know you were here earlier and you know, we had panels that were really talking about that in terms of artificial intelligence versus emotional intelligence, people intelligence. And I don't know if every, any of you watch Young Sheldon, which is the spin-off from the Big Bang Theory, 
but he has a twin sister who has high emotional intelligence and is considered the dummy in the family because you know he's so left-brained. And I, it just, we get along with people. We do better, basically. So I want to flip it. I asked you about the challenges. But now I want to, what were, the, what were the joys? What were the pleasures? What were the epiphanies along the way that would put you in a position to sit on a panel here with me and to encourage women in the audience? And for, unfortunately, I don't think we have any, any teenager, uh, young girls in the audience. But think as though you did. You know, what were the joys that would encourage you to encourage them to go into the high-tech world, into the sciences? You want me to? Sure, you have the mic. All right, okay. So, yeah, I mean, definitely there is, it's, it's a very rewarding journey, um, and it becomes more rewarding as soon as you realize that, uh, you know, the moment you kind of open up and accept yourself in your current shape and form, and when I mean that, when I say that, I mean in, with all your um, true self and, you know, with, with all your accomplishments and, and your failures and um, your weaknesses and strengths, then um, you ha you are, you've put yourself at a platform where you are now open to scout the world and uh, create or decipher your own path of uh, uh, success, in, or at least the path you want to tread upon. And um, that really is uh, a very gratifying experience. Um, so the, the moment you come out of, the, of um, the norms that dictate you in, in a and ask you to be in a certain form, and you break those barriers and you're able to um, define, first of all, for yourself on what you want to do and what you want to achieve, then you have, your mind starts to think about the paths you want to take and you want to create and the people you want to enable you to reach your goals. So I think that is great. Yeah, I'm, I just, um unique intersection of education and technology. The reality is that technology is where the action is. That's true. Okay, and action, influence, impact, and money. Okay, and also the excitement to see all the possibilities, is right? We talk about AI for healthcare. And so enable us to really uh, to do things which we otherwise cannot do, and open up new possibilities. So the, then from the other point is why I'm kind of dedicated to what I'm doing to advance women in technology is when I return from Chico to you know, uh, the endowed chair position. So I teach one lab section of 20, 23 students, only one woman. Okay, it's one thing to read the statistics. It's different to be there to say, okay, these are the freshman engineering students, only one woman, okay? Half of the humanity is missing from this picture. We know that AI will impact everybody's life. Something terribly wrong. So after that, I say, this is not right, okay? So that's why I start the, um, the Technology Pathways Initiative to bring computing education to more women in college. Okay, they need to have that tools to open door of the opportunity and open the door of the future. Okay, so, um, so I think I have a very unique position. And so talk about satisfying this, I bring this idea to um, the longtime benefactors and friends in the valley. They say, okay, the corporations, is right? Or Sandy Chow, actually Sandy Chow uh, here, you know, and, encourage me, say, your background is high tech, your higher education, of course, woman, you are in best position to champion this. You know, so that's, this, um, so when I talk to industry leaders, they say, how much money you want, Bell? What's the top level? You get it, okay? So to form Good that for consortium you. of corporations and that uh, are universities, because I say, this, has, this should be a broader, okay, because we're looking at more systemic change in how we teach computing, computer science education, 
Okay, so we have an alliance of six universities and, and four major corporations and Intel, Salesforce, KLA, Xilinx, Evo was here earlier, no. And so um, San Francisco State, San Jose State, UC Berkeley, UC Davis, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, UC Riverside, and now I'm talking to another campus. So this is um, so important, and we're talking about now the future of the individuals. We're talking about the future of the community and nation as a whole. You know, I taught in an MBA program for five years, and I taught a number of different courses. I would say that 90% of my students in the business and the MBA were men, and a few smattering of women. I also taught the capstone HR course for the same school, and there was only two men out of a whole room full of women. So there's, there's something about self-selection that still keeps women, or many women, uh, away from those really more powerful uh, professions. So my, my, my question on it, and give you a sure. second here, is lessons learned, you know, what kinds of things do you want to convey to the women coming up in the world so that that statistic we're both talking about changes? No, I think here is collective responsibility. When you're a young woman, or in general, it's right, and if you're not exposed to that, um, then you will not consider this. That's right, but the reality is universities these days, in the junior year, then you'll say, okay, I see there is a possibility, but there's no second chance, especially public universities. So that's I take upon you know, ourselves, people in higher education, universities, because university education is such a critical uh, uh, you know, path in a person's career pathway, is right? If you don't have that education, you don't have the key to open that door. Okay, so that's why I would say bring computing education to women, where women are, is right? Biology is such a good example. Even mathematics, 43% of math majors are, 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 are women, is right? So that's you have a data science program. In biology, you have bioinformatics program. Even psychology, 70% are women are in psychology. Psychology is the most popular major. So we then will bring to them, then you have, you know, uh, help students to gain job in user interface, in user interaction. So these are more opportunities. Here is just that people in like me or all my colleagues, you know, professors to say, you know, let's think ahead and do things differently. Yeah. So I, I exactly echo what um, Professor Wei is, uh, you know, saying. In fact, there are actually courses, and um, there's actually some very enlightening education on biases in the, particularly in the AI field, when it comes to women. In fact, there's even algorithms. AI algorithms are biased towards the understanding of data. Um, based on you know um, old dictionary biases that are no longer valid in the current world, actually, so uh, the, it still is a world which is kind of swayed towards that bias. So has it become the year of the woman? Has it become the year of the? Has it become the year of the woman in technology? Are the doors are the doors wide open? If you don't have a key. If well, you don't have the education, is the, education, education, education is, the is the key. Yeah. I think uh, it's the right kind of education. Um, the, the education that has been going on for decades will not change the numbers that we've been looking at. So, it, yes, it's true that women, uh, particularly at an early age, need to be encouraged to enter STEM careers. But at the same time, uh, what will excite them is to be able to see what's beyond that. Okay, what if I get a degree? How does that degree help me? What is the practical world offering in return for that degree? And um, the more that experience gets embedded into the education system, the better the, the, it will embed the confidence in, in the 
in, in the future workforce and it will position the future workforce towards swaying the numbers in favor of more women participating. So while you have the microphone, we have just a couple of more minutes. And um, final thoughts, final words. What have I failed to ask you that you would like to uh, leave with our audience? I think um, it is um, persistence as well as um, um, realizing that uh, you know the world is acknowledging the biases in the world and positioning yourself to be able to be in a position where you're able to convey to the world that a seat on the table for a certain woman makes a difference at that table. That, I think, comes with persistence and being, being entrepreneurial enough to show up in those spaces to be able to demonstrate live that the presence of that particular woman on the table does make a difference there. Thank you. Bill, final, final thoughts? Yes, um, to young women, I say be realistic about the, prop, you know, the barriers, but focus your energy on possibilities. Okay, thank you both very, very much. Um, that concludes our panel.